physics at the University of Stuttgart and since the early 80s has started to explore the potential of modeling concepts from theoretical physics for the formalization of socio-economic problems. He has a very nice book that's almost self-contained and without any knowledge of physics you should be able to understand uh, the, the methodological concepts, concepts and models of quantitative sociology, the dynamics of interacting populations. I think it's again in print, so it's, it's available. Uh, you should not bother too much about the sociology here. Wolfgang Weidlich and his collaborator at that time didn't distinguish between economics and sociology, so for them it was all the same. Most of it is about economic applications, actually quite interesting economic applications, and some of it is in uh, sociology. And later on there is a more comprehensive um, volume by Wolfgang Weitzig, Sociodynamics, a Systematic Approach to Mathematical Modeling in the Social Sciences, 2000, uh, which overlaps largely with this book but has more applications in partic particular in regional economics. Uh, he has turned for a long time to regional economics, became quite prominent in uh, regional economics and geography uh, circles, and that was the major, the major activities to which he, to which he applied uh, the concepts, more or less the concepts we are going to review here. <coughs> These books are, in particular, the first one, amazingly easy, at least to my, to my taste, reading of, of relatively advanced material and absolutely self-contained. Tougher reading is Aoki, Masanao Aoki, a very prominent economist who has given directions to economics many times in his life and from the start of the 90s tried to popularize exactly what I do today in the uh, statistical approach to human behavior. Uh, he has three books out, out, that's the second one. There's an earlier one from, I think, 97 uh, with a similar title. Uh, this one from 2002, Modeling Aggregate Behavior and Fluctuations in Economics, Stochastic Views of Interacting Agents. And there is a recent one of 2007, together with Yoshikawa, who is one of the main uh, economic policy figures in Japan, with the title Reconstructing Macroeconomics. Well, they put this kind of methodology to use to uh, redesign, so to say, Keynesian macroeconomics. To implement in a new way concepts like effective demand, liquidity uh, trap, and so on and so forth. So very recommended. I don't have it here, but just look for the three books of Masanawa Oki at Cambridge University Press. They are typically a bit harder to read than the ones by Weidlich, but uh, in particular the last one with Yoshikawa, Reconstructing Macroeconomics, is, is quite thought-provoking. There's also uh, special issue forthcoming of the new electronic journal that we have founded at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy um, on subjects related to this uh, reconstructing macroeconomics viewpoint, so macroeconomic applications of uh, stochastic interacting agents. I also have a chapter in the forthcoming new edition of the Handbook of Financial Economics on uh, financial applications of stochastic interacting agents. You can find that one on my homepage because the handbook is still in print. It's not available, but uh, you can download uh, the final version from my homepage. So we have come that far, looking at specific examples, one very simple population dynamics just to get a feel for this approach and second uh, uh, core model, so to say, of interaction of agents in a financial setting, in a sociological setting, whatever you want to have. You can think about voters here, you can think about fashion, you can think about financial traders who are bulls or peers and decide to switch to the opposite opinion under the influence of their peers. 
That was the analysis of the Fokker-Planck equation, the full probability density as it evolves over time. And we had as a second component here the analysis of the mean value dynamics. Both is largely complementary. Here you get the probabilistic viewpoint, you get the probability distribution, and if you look at the mean values, in fact, you would see that the modes of the probability density here, of the final stationary probability density, are the fixed points of the dynamic law in first order approximation to the mean value dynamics. What we wanted to look at, at least in order to, to increase, so to say, uh, the scope of our, of our dynamic analysis, was the second order dynamics. We have seen that the second order dynamics influences the first order dynamics. If we approximate or if we develop a Taylor expansion to second order, we see second order effects, which is quite natural. Second order effects are effects due to the second moment. Yeah? We see the second moment entering the mean value equation. Here you see the implementation, which looks a bit complicated, but it's mathematically straightforward to, uh, to arrive at this equation. Here you see the implementation of uh, the second order approximation to the mean value dynamics for our population dynamics. Yeah? That's what we have been analyzing so far. That's the systematic part that leads to a closed form solution for uh, our variable x bar, the mean value of the opinion index, first order component, and going to second order, we have something connected with the variance. Yeah. The variance again enters into the dynamics of the mean value, and this is the second derivative of the first chunk moment. Yeah, the second derivative of what we have here. Of course, it looks a bit complicated, but in principle it's straightforward to arrive at this formula. Now what is missing so far is sigma x squared. We don't have any knowledge about sigma x squared. We have to derive uh, the dynamic law for volatility in order to see the spillover between volatility and mean values. This is then, so to say, the final task here in order to set up our apparatus. And once we do it for volatility, we see how in principle it is to be done for the third moment, for the fourth moment, whatever you might be interested in. Dynamics of second moments. Now we define the second moment, the expected a value of x squared. Yeah. It's the sum over all possible realizations times their probability. Pretty much the same procedure as for first moments. Then we see that if we look at the change in time, then of course it is the sum over x squared times the change in time of the probability of each x, yeah, which again is the master equation or Fokker Planck equation, whether you want to use the exact version or the approximate version, I use the exact version here. You use the master equation and then perhaps for the sake of time I don't go through the relatively simple algebraic uh, uh, manipulations here. We do a few manipulations of this formula and we arrive at something that seems a bit more useful. You see more, or you, you can find more explanation of what is happening here in uh, the handout that I had also sent to you. We arrive, for example, at this version here after changing for one of these components uh, the order of the summation over x and x prime and so on and so forth. And if you remember the definition of the chunk moment, you see here popping up again the first chunk moment, yeah, x bar minus x the changes of x to other values x prime, excuse me, x prime times the pertinent transition rates. And then you see pretty much the same here with a square. And the square means that this one we could call the second chunk moment. It's simply the chunks to the square. So we use the same concept as before, defining the second chunk moment, and then you would need the third, the fourth, and so on chunk moment for higher order moments. The second chunk moment, and we can reduce this expression uh, to one involving the expected second chunk moment and the expected first chunk moment. Yeah. And these are expressions that we can read relatively easily solve for. So that's a more compact expression of the dynamics of the second moment. The variance, of course, is defined, as we know from the textbook. The 
change and the change in time of the variance is then given as the change in time of the expected second moment minus the change in time of the square of the first moment. Inserting our formulas for the second and for the first moment, we arrive at this exact expression here. Yeah? This exact expression. This, of course, involves, again, the full probability distribution from which we have to derive this expectation. And in order to get something that is manageable, again, we perform a Taylor series expansion. If we do that for these two terms of our variance dynamics, you know, both of them can be approximated in a Taylor series, then we see that the outcome is the following. Again, because of the expectation, there are luckily some terms that fully drop out because in expectation, these Taylor terms are equal to zero. And what remains is the second jump moment evaluated at x bar at the current expected value plus two times the current volatility because volatility is also changing. It's time t volatility times the first derivative of the first jump moment evaluated at x bar. And taking this together with the equation for the first jump moment, we have a closed system of two differential equations. Highly nonlinear, relatively complicated, depending on our dynamic system, on our population dynamics, but it's an autonomous closed system of two differential equations that in principle we can analyze. Again, if both of them are linear, this is exact, but if they are nonlinear, this is a second order. This is, in fact, a first order approximation. Yeah? Now we apply this. We apply this to our two examples to see what additional information we can we can squeeze out by looking at the second moment. First is the burst death process. This is the second jump moment. Yeah. The jumps are simply 1 over n, so to the square it's 1 over n squared, times the transition rate for the burst process, lambda times n, times the transition rate for the death process, mu times n over capital N times n. It's this one. And therefore, the simultaneous system of two equations looks like this. That's the simultaneous determination of the mean value and the variance. So to be clear, what do we get? What do we get if we solve this system? We get the conditional expectation of the second moment, conditional on time t, initial condition on the starting value. Yeah. The expected development of the mean value and the variance, which also means we get something, or we can easily get something like a confidence band for the mean value. We now get information about the precision of this development of the mean value, because the variance is the dispersion, or is, is of course a measure of dispersion of realizations around these mean values. This term here we can either keep or not. Yeah. If we keep it, then we have a second order approximation for the mean value and a first order approximation for the variance. If we drop it, we have a first order approximation for those components. Yeah. In the first or in the second case, you can solve the system recursively. You can first solve for the mean value and then for the variance, but if you keep it in the first case, <coughs> you have to solve simultaneously for both the mean and the variance. What can you do? Now, we have been looking for the equilibrium of the mean value before, that was lambda over mu, as you might remember. We can also look now at the equilibrium fluctuations. by setting the variance, or the change of the variance equal to zero. Yeah. Setting the left hand side equal to zero here, and inserting 
the equilibrium value for x bar, we would arrive at the equilibrium volatility of the system, <coughs> which after some manipulation turns out to be lambda over n times n. So we get a very simple formula. And we see in this system, obviously, the n dependence of volatility, the law of large numbers. The higher the population, or the higher the, it's the carrying capacity, in fact, of the environment in this example, the lower the fluctuations. You, know, you see a law of large numbers here. Fluctuations die out if the carrying capacity goes to infinity. That's actually obtained by using the first order approximation to the mean value, yeah, because we have the same formula as before. That means for these solutions, I have skipped this additional term here. I have used the first order approximation here together with the variance equation. It becomes a bit more complicated. It becomes a bit more complicated if we simultaneously solve for both the stationary mean and the stationary variance. It, the formula looks a bit complicated. I don't show, the, uh, don't show you the formula here. I just give you an indication of the differences. This is an example, the one we had before. This, oh, is this visible? Yeah, roughly visible. This is the mean value to second order. Yeah. To first order, it's always 0.5. It's always 0.5 because we don't have the interaction with the variance, or we simply skip the interaction with the variance. That's what we get from this formula for first order approximation. The variance for different numbers of uh, the carrying capacity here are 0.0025 and 0.025, for example. And if we compare that with the second order approximation, we see in the more complicated formula that I do not show explicitly here, but that is easy, at least straightforward, maybe somewhat cumbersome algebraically, but straightforward in principle to develop, we get a different number. We get a different number. The number is relatively close to 0.5 if n is high, but you see that the difference might be sizable if n is relatively small. That actually shows uh, the accuracy of the appro approximation, which depends on the number of agents, which depends on the number of agents in the system, and there are also some changes here for the equilibrium, for the equilibrium uh, volatility. <clears throat> that it is smaller than 0.5 is clear immediately because we have a negative effect here of volatility. So the true equilibrium, so to say, is smaller than 0.5, what we get from the first order approximation. The second order approximation, in fact, is exact. It's exact because we only have second order terms in the differential equations. There's nothing more, uh, no terms of higher order if we continue our Taylor series expansion. So all higher order terms would vanish. And therefore, these are the exact numbers in this simple example for the mean value of the population. Why is it smaller than 0.5? Question for the students. Intuitively, why is it smaller than 0.5? With these uh, numbers that the birth rate is 1 and the death rate is 2. If you try to explain it in intuitive terms, What's the reason for that? Now the reason is the non-linearity. You know? Because of the increase of the death rate with the population, you have over-proportionally many cases of death if the random fluctuations drive you beyond 0.5, say the virtual equilibrium. And you have less cases of death, proportionally, if you are below 0.5. So you have a certain asymmetry, asymmetry because of the uh, competition within the population and the increase of, of uh, mortality with, with an increasing population, which biases the system to a true equilibrium value below 0.5. 
0.5 you get if you don't take into account this asymmetry. Yeah? But if you take into account this asymmetry, which means the feedback which is in here, yeah, which is incorporated here in this feedback from the second moment, then you see that because of this asymmetry, because you have overproportionately many deaths, if you have a high value of the population, you have a somewhat lower, you have a somewhat lower <coughs> average number of individuals. And the effect is more pronounced the smaller the overall carrying capacity of the environment. Might also have to do something with with a general mathematical fact, um, which which I know uh, holds for diffusions. Uh, for diffusions, you also consider the equilibrium distribution, which is kind of the if you would consider this distribution that uh, uh, the T go to infinity, you get an equilibrium distribution, a limit distribution, and uh, the funny thing is that the then the expected value of the equilibrium distribution is in general not the same mm -hmm. as the limit of the expected value. Mm -hmm. Because, of, of, because yeah. of the yes, and distribution the other, of the noise factors. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. generally get the minus something which depends mm -hmm. on the variance mm -hmm. which, which puts yeah. Yeah. lower. So that's, mm -hmm. that's related, okay. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. If you have a diffusion approximation of this one, mm -hmm. which in fact you would have, because second order is exact in this case, you would see the same effect. Yeah. That's the effect seen from your point of view and from the point of view of this apparatus, yeah. it, is, it pops up in, in the negative feedback from volatility. Yeah. So then we, we in fact have completely solved this, this model. You can also use the variance in order to uh, in order to compute something like 95% uh, confidence intervals, for example, around around uh, the mean value. And you would see, if you perform simulations, that they nicely obey these 95% or whatsoever uh, confidence intervals. Now let's come back again to the more interesting, what I call herding model, where we really have agents that do something which might be economically relevant. Here the second chunk moment again can be easily computed. If for the moment I set alpha O equal to zero to not have too many parameters here and alpha one I simply denote by alpha, I get this equation for the dynamics of the variance of X. Yeah. Here again the mean value or the second chunk moment and here the first derivative of the first chunk moment, that's all straightforward, but it looks a bit complicated. And again, we can compute the variance in steady state by setting the left hand side equal to zero, and we come up with this somewhat unlucky expression here. But this expression, in fact, can be simplified by inserting uh, the expressions you get for the equilibrium of the first moment and then more details you can find you can find in my handouts if <coughs> the equilibrium is unimodal yeah, which is the case if alpha is below 1 alpha equal to 1 was the threshold between unimodality and bimodality if it is unimodal and using x equal to zero as the solution for the unimodal uh, case, this simplifies enormously to one over two n times one minus alpha. Mm -hmm. And in the case of bimodality, where we have a positive and a negative majority, which are symmetric in this case, it simplifies to this expression here, just by inserting. Uh, the equilibrium condition for the mean value. Mm -hmm. So, what can we extract from that? Again, we see the m dependency. We can, as we discussed this morning, get rid of the m dependency. It's actually an uh, important problem in financial economics, one that has been totally neglected in, in traditional uh, financial economics, that in finance we don't have a law of large numbers. We have large numbers of traders, but we don't see any convergence to 
the limiting distribution, the normal distribution or levy or what it might be, at least not for daily data. Also daily data are already the aggregate of a huge number of intra-daily data and we aggregate over thousands, maybe millions of, of traders. We don't see anything like the law of large numbers and if we try to approach that with an agent-based model, that also means that we have to get rid here of this M dependency. So there have to be some long-range effects among individuals, but this is an uh, advanced topic to which I do not come here. Here we have the M dependency. So the fluctuations die out if we increase the number of agents. But what is perhaps even more interesting here is the dependency on the parameters of the model. I have skipped alpha O, the bytes. The only parameter is the herding intensity alpha. You might also realize that the third parameter V drops out. V was the frequency of re-evaluation of opinions by the agents. That only governs the speed of evolution of the system. It's not relevant for the stationary states. So this parameter totally drops out and the only parameter that appears here is alpha. Yeah. And what you can see is that this one, if you increase alpha, this one is only relevant if alpha is smaller than 1, yeah? because that's the, uh, that's the set of values of alpha where you get unimodality. And if you increase alpha within uh, the range 0 to 1, you see that if you approach 1, the volatility increases. Here it's a bit harder to see, but with some effort, because that one again is endogenous, so you also have to take into account that the maturity changes. With some effort, you would see that if you increase alpha, that one decreases. Taken together, you get the following overall outcome in terms of first and second moments of our system. This is something like a bifurcation diagram. This one is pretty standard. That's the, is there a dynamic system specialist? Pitchfork bifurcation. Yeah? Pitchfork bifurcation. Here is alpha. Yeah? The horizontal axis is uh, represents alpha values, the herding intensity. Alpha equal to 1 is the crucial parameter. At alpha equal to 1, you move from unimodality to bimodality. Here you see the unimodality. The only fixed point is x equal to 0, a balanced disposition of traders. And then at alpha equal to 1, it branches into two separate equilibria, a positive and a negative majority, which become more pronounced the higher the value of alpha is, which is plausible because the higher the herding intensity, the larger the positive or negative majority might be. This one, in principle, still exists, but it becomes unstable. That's why I have illustrated it with a broken line here. Yeah, this is the pitchfork bifurcation, a very well-known phenomenon in dynamic systems which applies to our system and characterizes the transition from unimodality to bimodality. And here we see something that you typically don't see in dynamic system analysis, namely the consequences of, these, of this bifurcation for the second moment. Yeah, this is the behavior of the variance, the stationary variance, Depending on alpha, you see the variance is relatively low for small values of alpha because then you have purely stochastic fluctuations without a systematic component. And it's also very low for high values of alpha because then you have so strong herding behavior, interaction intensity that uh, agent's behavior is extremely uniform, but it increases if you approach these uh, bifurcation value from both sides and it goes to infinity which means that the uncertainty of the behavior of the system increases without limit close to the bifurcation threshold alpha equal to 1. Again the variance is if this is the hypothesized system from the viewpoint of the researcher is the uncertainty of the behavior of the system even if we know that this is the true data generating process, how the process will end up, where the process will end up, is very uncertain if alpha is close to this bifurcation value. Yeah. And any 
predictability is very limited. We can very nicely predict in this region and this region, but the process is very unpredictable, so to say, if we have alpha close to, close to 1. I hope I have time at the end to uh, show you uh, at least one example of an empirical estimation of this model. And as it turns out, when we have estimated this model with empirical data, we often find alpha in the critical region. We typically find alpha in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood of one. It seems to be a very robust feature of survey data, and it almost seems as robust to us as the typical gauge parameters that you get for financial data. If you estimate gauge models with financial data, you always get the same parameters, pretty much the same parameters. And also with this model, you always get something uh, with an alpha pretty close to one. So critical behavior of the system, which is somewhere on the border between unimodality and bimodality, and very hard to predict in its further development. A few more, uh, a few more results here on these general uh, interaction dynamics. Here you see five samples. Yeah, empirical simulations with different colors. I have always taken, taken as the starting value x equal to zero. So I used a neutral initial condition, but strong herding intensity, alpha one equal to 1.1. With strong herding intensity, I get bimodality. The two solid blue lines are the attractors, the modes of the probability density and the attractors of the mean value dynamics. And the broken lines are illustrating two sigma boundaries, two sigma bands around the mean values. Yeah. This should be something like roughly 95% confidence intervals that can be theoretically derived. And what you see is that the dynamics is nicely contained within these 95% confidence intervals. So the theoretical results nicely coincide with uh, the visual impression from the simulations. Of course, occasionally you have deviations, but it only needs to be contained within these boundaries for 95% of cases. What these boundaries do not cover is transitions from one equilibrium to the other one. Yeah? Because this is, in a sense, a local analysis. The local mean value and the local volatility. But it does not cover the transition that occasionally happens from one equilibrium to the other. The switch from a dominantly optimistic uh, perception to a dominantly pessimistic perception, which happens here, for example. So it's the local invariant distribution, so to say, that we get in this way. It covers only fluctuations within the bazaar of attraction of one of these fixed points. What you can also do is to look at the transient dynamics. Yeah. To look at the transient dynamics, this is a similar picture, but in this picture I have highlighted not only the limiting values, yeah. these are the limiting values, or is is constructed on the base of the limiting value, the stationary value of the variance, which of course only is reached after a certain span, time span in my simulations. If I start the simulation, then sigma t also is evolving, because sigma t follows this dynamic process. Sigma t is not constant, but is evolving over time. And this evolution is shown here. I start this time with a slight negative initial condition, slightly negative initial condition, yeah, minus 0.04, means a few agents more are pessimistic than optimistic. If a few agents more are pessimistic than optimistic, then the mean value dynamics, this is this line here, yeah, will be drawn towards the pessimistic majority, that's the mean value dynamics, this one here. Yeah. And the broken lines now, 
these ones are the dynamic 95% confidence intervals. They start very narrow because I have a given initial condition. It is known, so they start with a variance equal to zero, essentially. Eventually, they converge to what we had in the previous picture. Yeah. Eventually, they converge to this band here, which remains constant if we are in steady state. But what is interesting is the transient behavior. Yeah. First, in the transient period, the volatility increases tremendously, and then it goes down and converges to its stationary level. Yeah. So the uncertainty for me as the observer of this system first increases tremendously. You have this very wide band here, and then it goes down eventually and converges to its steady state level. Why? Because this convergence to the negative majority initially is very uncertain. You also see simulations here, yeah? Uh, the green line, the violet line, the red line, there's another green one here, and so on and so forth. You see that with this starting value, sometimes you converge, in fact, to the pessimistic majority, but often you, in fact, also converge to the optimistic one. And therefore, the ultimate tendency here in the initial stage of the simulation is very uncertain. Yeah. The uncertainty about the system behavior for me, because this is the smooth lines are my expectations of the system behavior, the expectation of the mean value, and the uncertainty connected with this mean value, namely the dynamic variance, my uncertainty about the system behavior is very high because I'm very close to the benchmark between the Bassin of attraction of the optimistic and the pessimistic majority, very easily via random disturbances I could move upward instead of downward. I expect on average a downward movement, but the certainty associated with that uh, is relatively small. The level of certainty associated with that is relatively small, and that is captured by the huge increase of the variance, first it becomes very uncertain for me, but then after some time this uncertainty vanishes and in case I have converged to the pessimistic majority, uh, the fluctuations are contained within the limiting 95% uh, band. So you can capture both transient dynamics of the system behavior and the limiting dynamics, and you see after 10 or 15 periods, depending on my parameters, you are already very close to the limiting behavior. But initially you might be quite far away from the limiting distribution of the fluctuations around the steady state. <coughs> And the interpretation is, in fact, the uncertainty about system behavior from the viewpoint of somebody who knows that this is the data generating process, knows the initial conditions, and wants to make a forecast of the system for the next periods. The solid line here is my forecast of the most probable state of the system at any point in time, and the broken lines here is my uncertainty of this mean value forecast. The uncertainty first increases and then decreases, so it's non-monotonic, which is, which is quite, quite interesting. So that should now be integrated into a financial market model. That will be a component for interactions of agents within a financial market model and I identify the plus and the minus group as bullish and bearish speculators. The transition probabilities would then account for a possible bias, if there is a bias towards bullishness or bearishness. Herding behavior, that's just what we have seen here. 
And we also allow for a reinforcement of herding by the momentum of prices, the price changes. Which leads to this <coughs> extended formula here, the same as before, but I have added here a new component where we have feedback from P, P is prices, and P prime is the change in time of price, momentum, from momentum on to transition probabilities or transition rates. So traders are not influenced, not influenced only by the behavior of their peers, which is still there, but this influence is reinforced or weakened by the momentum they see in the market, which is quite plausible. If this is positive and if momentum is positive, then they have more reason to believe in, uh, in the accuracy of a bullish prediction. Yeah. And then the pressure for moving from the minus to the plus group to the group of bulls becomes even higher. But if this is negative, then it might neutralize the influence of other traders and therefore we might end up with a sum which is equal to or relatively close to zero. So no dominating effect and vice versa for the transition probability from plus to minus. I have to divide here by V in order to normalize the momentum because 1 over V is the mean time between changes of opinion. So I have to use the momentum over successive changes, possible changes or mean changes of opinion of the individuals. So then I get something which simply compared to what we have done previously contains this new element. Uh, the change of the sentiment index is given by this formula in which I have simply added to what we had before the influence of momentum. And what I also add is price dynamics in order to have something that could be used here in order to derive momentum from the market operations. Following the behavioral finance literature, I add a simple Valrhasian price adjustment equation, which says that prices increase according to the sign of excess demand. Beta is price adjustment speed. And excess demand can be decomposed into excess demand of chartists. Chartists are simply my bulls and beers and excess demand of fundamentalists. So a very straightforward type of chartist fundamentalist model. <clears throat> the chartists are the bullish or, bullish or beerish agents. And for simplicity, I assume that, or for tractability if you like, that all of these chartists have a given transaction volume which is TC, transaction volume TC. And it's pretty plausible that those who are bullish appear as buyers in the market and those who are bearish appear as sellers. So I get the overall excess demand as transaction volume per agent times the number of optimistic agents minus the number of pessimistic agents. One advantage compared to a standard Chartist fundamentalist models is that now I have some heterogeneity even within the Chartist group. Because some of them are optimistic, others are pessimistic. I might even have a situation where all of the trading of the Chartists can be carried out within this group. If I have a balanced disposition, excess demand would be equal to zero. And I would only have positive or negative excess demand in aggregate of the chartist groups of the chartist group if there is a positive or negative majority among them. Fundament fundamentalist excess demand is pretty standard. I assume that it depends on the difference between uh, perceived fundamental value, which for the moment is taken to be constant, and the current market price, and TF is uh, 
parameter for the variability of the fundamentalist's demand. Taking both components together, I get a dynamic system of two differential equations in sentiment, x, you know, and process, p. The sentiment dynamics is well known. It only has this additional component, the feedback from momentum. And the price dynamics is pretty standard. You can find similar formulas in many, many behavioral finance papers. It's also what you find in the microstructure literature. If you look at uh, Klostman Milcom, for example, or Kyle, uh, where you have market maker, market maker behavior being analyzed on the base of uh, Bayesian information transmission, then you find that they end up essentially with the same kind of adjustment equation. So it's pretty much the industry standard in financial economics for rough and red, ready description of price dynamics. And what we want to analyze here is then the interaction between endogenous sentiment and price dynamics. <coughs> and in fact, for many markets, both of them are measurable. So you can estimate, you can estimate this model. It's something I have just started to do. Uh, since you have sentiment data of the same format for the US stock market, I don't know about uh, UK, probably you have some sentiment measures somewhere uh, collected by some uh, financial institutions. You have certainly these sentiment measures for Germany and for other countries as well. Let's just look for a dynamic equilibrium first, where you don't have any change anymore. Well, this is defined by the condition we already encountered before for the sentiment index, and the price in equilibrium is this one. The price is equal to the fundamental value if sentiment is balanced, if x is equal to zero. And we know x is equal to zero from that equation if we have weak interaction only. However, x is positive or negative in equilibrium if we have strong interaction. And then, of course, the price is above or below the fundamental value. So if we have an optimistic or pessimistic majority, we get overvaluation or undervaluation of the asset. And how does this uh, relate to general arbitrage? If, if the, the, the equilibrium price is higher than the fundamental price, does, does this cause any trouble with the um, Here you, maybe we come back to that, because it's, it's a stochastic system, I mean, uh, the question is how much of what we can get out uh, theoretically if we know the system you could squeeze out from observations of the system if you would not know the data generating process. We should come to back to that later on. That's actually one of, one of the questions we have pursued. Here it looks very simple, yeah, and it looks very exploitable, in fact. Um, what we find is a unique steady state if alpha is small, alpha 1 is below 1, together with prices equal to the fundamental value, and multiple steady states bubble equilibria because we have overvaluation or undervaluation. Otherwise, here are some simulations that already have provide something like a partial answer to your question, but better answers come in a moment. Um, this is the case with the fundamental equilibrium. This is actually a plot in X and P uh, space. Here you have isoclines for uh, for those scenarios where you don't have a change of x anymore and you don't have a change of p anymore, but this is, this is not very important. Here you see a plot of uh, the coordinates that you get in the simulation because it's not, uh, yeah, you don't see so much, but it's fluctuating here around 0 and 10, which is my fundamental value. Here you see the price fluctuations around the fundamental value, and here you see the fluctuations of the index around uh, a balanced disposition. That's pretty stochastic, and it should be stochastic because we have weak interaction. Here you have bubble equilibria, positive or negative. Yeah, these are these two points. You see sometimes fluctuations around 
the positive and around the negative equilibrium, but you also see a movement from the positive to the negative and vice versa. And if you have a limited simulation, you see that you first have a phase of undervaluation here and then comes a phase of overvaluation. 10 is the uh, fundamental value, whereas in terms of sentiment, it first becomes strongly negative and then uh, switches to strongly positive. It switches between these two modes. That looks exploitable still. Uh, another possibility that emerges is that of persistent oscillations between undervaluation and overvaluation. This is this case. So the movement is like this, but in a stochastic fashion. And you see you have clearly identifiable cycles both in prices, also of course blurred by the stochasticity and in the sentiment index. That should be exploitable by somebody who knows a bit about dynamic systems. Uh, probably I skipped that. Uh, you can get uh, stability conditions on the base of uh, as analysis of the eigenvalues of the dynamic system and so on and so forth. And you would find that in terms of the previous plot, yeah, this is again our pitchfork bifurcation, there is now a new region in which you get cyclic behavior. And this region includes the bifurcation point. So you have stable unimodal or bimodal behavior here and here, but in between now there is no equilibrium, no stable equilibrium anymore, but there is a cyclic uh, dynamics, but just leave it like that. Beyond mean values, this was only the mean value dynamics, but again, yeah, it, was, it was based on the analysis of the 2 by 2 dynamic system for the mean of x and the mean of p. Again, you can analyze variances here. With the same principles as before, developing the dynamic law for the variance of prices, for the variance of the sentiment index, and since you have a two-dimensional system, you also need a dynamic law for the covariance between x and p. You get this from the bivariate master equation. I just show that for illustration. I don't go too much into detail here. We have to consider now transitions both for the sentiment index and for the price. So you have to come up with a stochastic law for the price, but it's very easy to provide a stochastic counterpart of, of our dynamic equation for prices. That not, that's not much of a concern. And then you have the same, the same approach as before. Taylor series expansions to the mean value dynamics. This is the mean value for x. Looks a bit more complicated because you have to take into account the probability distribution over x and p, all possible values of x and p. And then you get a Taylor series expansion of the dynamic laws for the first jump moment. They include, they include a first order term again. And they include a second order term in which now the variance of x, the variance of p, and the covariance between the two of them appears. It's just the extension of what we have done before to the, of course, more cumbersome second order or two by two case for a dynamic system. All is, or all the apparatus is applied in pretty much the same way as before. This would be the first order approximation. That's actually uh, coinciding with the system we have seen before, and in principle we can add the second order correction. Yeah. And the second order correction you see again interact with the variances and covariances, and for those we need explicit dynamic laws again. I skipped this one and for just for the, the sake of illustration, the same principle as before. 
I define the second moment and the cross moment here. The time change then involves the time change of the probability distribution. I can go through the whole apparatus again. I get similar formulas, but they become progressively more complicated. The same for P, for the second moment of prices, and for the covariance. And so at the end, I come up with three dynamic equations for uh, the three second moments that I need here. All in all, I have in order to characterize the first and second moment dynamics of the system, five equations, five interacting dynamic equations. This is the exact form of these three second moment equations. And of course, again, I have to approximate those and I end up in first order approximation with what you see here. <clears throat> That's of course quite complicated and to do that for a particular system is almost enough stuff, at least for one chapter of a PhD thesis. What is, without going too much into the numerical details here, what is more interesting is to point out what the insights would be from such a system. You know? What you see immediately, and in fact that has been pointed out on a general level by James Ramsey in the paper of 1996 already, what you see is again, and I have emphasized that for the simpler system before, the interaction between mean, mean value between mean value and variance. Yeah? Again, you have an avenue towards uh, towards interaction between means, because the mean appears here, x bar, p bar, and the variance. But what is more, you see autoregressive behavior of the variances. The ch time change of the variance of prices, for example, includes on the right-hand side as one of its determinants the variance of prices itself. So you get an avenue that automatically leads you towards arch effects. Arch effects are, so to say, a built-in feature in some way of agent-based dynamics. Of course, it's not clear that you get the, the right kind of arch effects, the ones we see in the data. For that, you need the right model, so to say. But agent-based models, in principle, allow you to model autoregressive behavior of volatility. And we can, again, for this richer system, uh, carry out an analysis of the variances in stationary state and of the transient dynamics uh, of the variance. You can again solve for stationary variances and covariances around the fundamental state, the fundamental steady state and the bubble equilibrium, as we have seen before. This is one result that you get if you really dig into this exercise for the stationary variance. Pretty much the same picture that I showed before, but now taking into account that uh, we also have prices. So this is the variance of prices of the system in the stationary distribution depending on the parameter alpha 1. We see we have the same type of behavior except for the fact that we do not have a stationary variance in the cyclical regime. In the middle part, we don't get, we don't get a stationary solution, so this is simply empty. And the variance increases to infinity if we approach the boundary of this empty region, so to say, this cyclic region from the left and to the right. So, what we see here is that even for a value of alpha 1 below 1, we enter a situation where the dynamics of the system or the behavior of the system becomes very uncertain, the variance goes to infinity, and the same happens for this value above 1, where we move from the cyclical regime to a bubble equilibria with a majority of optimistic or pessimistic individuals and overvaluation or undervaluation. So I should allow you 